editors across the state of Florida, especially women who were writing food, food storylines, have talked about the importance of food culture in Florida. To help us understand this important chapter of Florida's social history, we're so fortunate to have Kim Loss, who's a professor over at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, and she's going to talk about food editors in Florida. Kim. Thank you, and thank you for coming today. Um, but in the mid-1990s, I started studying the women's pages of newspapers. If you looked at journalism history, women didn't really exist at all. And part of that was not looking at the women's pages. Um, I was born in 1970, and that was kind of women's pages were leaving, so I had no awareness in my lifetime of them. And what history said, if it said anything at all about the women's pages, is that it was fluff. Nothing important was happening. There was nothing significant. But no one ever checked it out. And we do that too often, I think, with women's history, make assumptions and don't bother to kind of look at what's there. So that's where I started. My dissertation was looking at what was actually in the women's pages rather than making these assumptions. And it turned out it was quite interesting what they were doing. In large part, it was because their male managers never read it. They could do whatever they wanted in those sections. So you saw some things that we'll talk about today with traditional content like food. But you also saw the beginnings of questions about inequality in pay, the need for daycare, sexual harassment, they didn't have the word for it yet, but these concepts were kind of mixed in um, that really set the foundation in the 1950s, 1960s for what we'll think of as kind of the second wave or women's liberation in the late 60s and early 1970s. Um, this era, the 1950s and 60s, is what Marjorie Paxson called the golden era for the women's pages, and that was most true in Florida. Marjorie Paxson was like many of the women I'll talk about today. She graduated from journalism school, um, University of Missouri in her case, right as World War II was beginning. So she, like lots of women of that era, got to do all sorts of things they never otherwise would have been able to do because they'd only been restricted to the women's pages. So Marjorie got to work for the Associated Press, where she and her female colleague could cover everything they wanted other than two things, football and executions. Everything else was now open to them. Um, and so most newspapers um, on the news had suddenly had women covering hard news. When peace came, the women had to go back to the women's section. But the women's sections inherently changed. These women had seen things, and done things, that changed the character of these women's sections. Marjorie Paxson um, was at the Miami Herald women's page, uh, as well as the St. Pete Times women's page. Eventually, she becomes the fourth female publisher with the Gannett Company. Um, she becomes a publisher um, in Oklahoma. And if you think a woman doesn't matter when they reach those positions, she changed two important roles at her newspaper her first day. This is 1984. One, women could wear pants in the newsroom for the first time. Two, they were now pro-ERA. And so these were the kinds of things, that, these were the kinds of women that were kind of coming through the 50s and the 1960s. This is 1950. This is the women's page of the Miami Herald. Um, and this is pretty much how newspapers worked at the time. There was a women's section, and it was in a separate room, sometimes a separate floor away from where the men worked. The theory was that the women couldn't handle the cursing. But I've read enough letters from these women to know they cursed just as much as the men did. But that was the theory anyway. And so this is kind of how it worked. They were marginalized clearly at their newspapers, but they made the most of those sections. Um, again, it was a place for them to get hired. You know, we think a lot about women's history and, and labor. We talk a lot about educated women. It was nursing or teaching or librarians. But we've had women's pages since the 1880s at newspapers. So this was also a foot in the door for journalism for them, right? Um, and so in looking at the women's pages, initially the thought was it was the four Fs. Family, fashion, food, and furnishings. And that's all it was. Um, and not that those things aren't important, which I'll talk about soon. But it wasn't just that. Um, there were also club news. And club women played an important role in all of their communities. And initially, especially with the women's section. For example, let's say there was a problem in a community, juvenile delinquency, library needs books, schools need something. They would call the journalists who would go to the women's clubs and encourage them to take them on as projects. And then once they did, they were covered as news. So there was this kind of relationship that helped to improve their communities. Um, we also had lots of brides, lots of babies. There used to be a, a saying that a proper woman's name was in the newspaper three times. She was born, she got married, and she died. So we'll talk about today, I think there's actually a fourth time, and that's when her recipes got in the newspaper. It was an accessible time to be there. Um, we saw in the back corner here is Eleanor Hart. She was an advice columnist. Every women's page had an advice columnist, nationally and locally. But the local ones were important. In this case, Eleanor Hart, her section discussed women in the workforce, which of course is interesting because they all were in the workforce, right? Um, should, work, should mothers work? Should we integrate neighborhoods? All those important questions were in 
the women's pages. Um, and really, the, uh, in the back corner there is Roberta Applegate, who was the club editor. During the war, she was the first woman to be a press secretary in Michigan to, a Michigan go to any governor in Michigan. Um, Peacetime, she lost the position, and she ends up in Miami. Miami had the best women's section um, in the 50s and 60s for numerous reasons. One is good talent attracts more good talent. Uh, the growth of Miami in the post-war years, um, the amount of money that they were willing to pay. Um, and really, as we'll kind of see here, um, that was because of these two women. Dorothy Journey and Marie Anderson. Don't you love the white gloves that they're wearing here? Uh, all sorts of pictures. Can you imagine the heat in Miami? They wore these long gloves and these hats, and sometimes netting. Uh, it's just amazing to me. Um, but these were the women that, that in many ways started the important journalism uh, for the women's pages in Florida. Um, Marie Anderson um, was a fifth generation Floridian. Uh, her mother had a law degree, one of the first in Florida, though never practiced. Her dad was a judge. Um, they had a lot of money. To give you an impression, during the Great Depression, Marie spent the time golfing. That's how wealthy she was. Um, and so she gets involved with the servicemen's peer, because of course she doesn't have to have paid employment, becomes the first single woman to head the Junior League in Miami. Um, and it was that act of work that got her introduced to many of the women that were at the Miami News. That's how she meets Dorothy Journey. Dorothy Journey's mother was a suffragette. Her father was a newspaper publisher. Sadly, she had to sell subscriptions to the newspaper during the Great Depression. That was her job. Um, but the two of them um, really changed uh, the Miami Herald when they get there in 1950. Lee Hills was the editor and asked them to create something worth reading. Um, so with her position in society and her knowledge of journalism and feminism, um, they were quite the powerhouse in the 1950s. Uh, Jean Volz was their food editor, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so eventually, Dorothy Journey gets divorced and leaves in 1960, and then Marie Anderson becomes a women's page editor. So for 20 years, they dominated. Um, and they were the ones that had ment uh, mentored Marjorie Paxson, who I mentioned earlier. Another great um, women's page editor at that time, which again is where food was located, uh, was Billy O'Day. Billy O'Day was at the Miami News. Um, she loved to play football and music growing up. It wasn't until she got to college and her music professors realized what could happen to her fingers that they forced her to stop playing football. Um, and she ends up in the 1940s coming to Miami, where she um, played in the orchestra as one of the only women um, to conduct. Four years she conducted the Miami Orchestra. Uh, she eventually becomes the women's page editor at the Miami News, where she stays for many years. Um, she's also on the air uh, and had a, had a show, Billy and Mike, I think it was. Um, her name was actually Billy Womack. When she came here to go on the radio, they changed her name, and she continued that being her byline uh, throughout the rest of her career. Ann Rowe, um, if you're from the St. Pete area, you may recognize that name, Ann Rowe, later Ann Rowe Goldman. Um, she was a little unique compared to most of the women in that she didn't go to journalism school. She actually um, toured the St. Pete Times newsroom when she was in high school and fell in love with reporting. Um, not realizing, of course, what she most fell in love with she could never do because it was police reporting and that sort of thing for her time. Um, in the 1950s, this is. Uh, so she eventually begins working in their library and works her way up to becoming a women's page editor. Uh, I actually did a talk like this recently to my undergrads, and they had no idea who Elvis was, which I thought was kind of sad in terms of understanding an important, important relic there. Um, but Anna Rowe then begins to learn journalism at the St. Pete Times. Um, Henrietta Poiter took her under her wing. Um, Henrietta gave her her, her fur coat when she went to cover the fashion um, weeks. Well, it wasn't fashion week then, but the fashion news that was in New York City. But it was things like fashion and food that allowed these women to travel, to learn different things, um, and to network in ways they couldn't do otherwise. I love this uh, picture. This was in Ann Rowe's home um, when, when she died still. So a young Elvis puts his arm around a very young Anne. Um, I want to say maybe she was 22 there. Um, the picture ends up going viral for its day on the wires and gets lots and lots of uh, attention. Um, it was an interesting story. She then sees him again when he comes down to play, I think, in Tampa. Um, and she's 42 years old and pregnant, and he, of course, is fat Elvis at this point. And so she writes a comment about the differences in the 20 years of their lives and kind of what, uh, what has happened. She eventually um, becomes the head of the day section. If you've kind of read it all about journalism history, uh, ben Bradley gets credit at the Washington Post for changing into the lifestyle sections by creating the style section. But the St. Pete Times was at about the same time. It's just that Ben Bradley was much better at public relations and, of course, was in Washington. Um, but she was part of what was called the Filthy Five. Five journalists went to, uh, went to a hotel room for one full week to brainstorm how to change the women's section into a modern feature section. And it was called Day. And every day they have a different topic. Um, and she was the head of the Day section. And that was important because as these women's sections transitioned, usually a man headed it. 
and Anne headed hers in her position. She's also, from what I can tell, the first woman to be an ombudsman at a newspaper um, anywhere. I've, I, there's no other, day, no other woman that seems to pre predate her. And it, I think they were the fifth in the country to get one, so it's pretty likely that she was the one. Edie Green. Edie Green is one of my favorites. Um, she was um, a longtime women's page editor at the Fort Lauderdale News. She comes down to Florida. She's from New Jersey. Um, she initially gets an on-air program on um, WSUN, Why Stay Up North. Um, every radio station had at least one woman that had a show. Um, and she eventually marries a man and ends up staying at home for 17 years, raising their three children and helping him with his advertising business. One day he comes home and says, I'm leaving you for the lady next door. So, as she said, I picked myself up by my bra straps and got myself a job. Um, and she, had, she uh, asked for no alimony and she had full custody of these children. So she gets a job as a women's page editor at the Orlando Sentinel, in Orlando at the time. She ends up marrying the sports editor and the Orlando Sentinel, like many newspapers at the time, had a rule. You couldn't be married to anyone else at the newspaper. And of course, usually the woman made less, so usually she was the one that left. Um, they decided they didn't like that, and they both head over to, the, to Fort Lauderdale, where they both get hired at the news, who were willing to not do that. And Edie, to me, represents, uh, she was a humorist. She wrote a very funny column. Um, but she's also that dichotomy of a woman at that time, how she felt about feminism. Um, she spent a lot of time saying she wasn't a feminist. However, um, she, wrote, she wrote a letter um, in 1970, on the bottom of that letter, or 1972, at the bottom of that letter, she said, P.S., I wore pants to work today. Well, it was Women's Equality Day, so that was her way of kind of saying that she was contributing. But in addition, for all her saying she wasn't a feminist, um, there was a, a, a young mother um, in Fort Lauderdale whose husband had been beating her. So she went to the local women's shelter, um, and after a night or two away from her children, she felt bad and returned home, as I think many people who have young children would do. That night, that husband shot and killed her in front of her children. As soon as Edie found out about that, she started a campaign to raise money for the shelter that accepts children that's still there today. In fact, it just celebrated its 50th anniversary, and that was her. When um, a new restaurant opened in town and decided that they weren't gonna serve women at lunch, which is not an uncommon practice, sadly, at the time, she and her fellow grandmothers got on their tennis shoes and marched to protest. <laughs> so, you know, it was these women that were doing these kind of amazing things, but just had to kind of um, find their own way, if you will, in that time. Uh, if you ever drive the Greenway up in Orlando, that's named for her son. So, to get to the food section. So I knew a lot about the women's pages. And I'd studied at this point probably about 25 women's sections to know how significant, how important these women were. But within that story was the food sections of that era, of the 1950s and 1960s, were horrible. Everyone said it. Um, they were either women who were unethical, because they accepted aver those local advertising and grocers' words and didn't question for the consumer. Or they were just recipes, which always bothered me because we communicate in recipes, right? Sharing a recipe is part of our family or part of our culture. Um, so just recipes, to me, kind of reduced the important work. Um, but it also didn't make sense to me. If the women's pages otherwise had all this great important content, why would food be the exception? Why would they look the other way every time it was food? Um, probably the most well-known uh, discussion of food at this time was a book called The United States of Arugula. It was very popular. It was written by a man named David Camp. When it came to what I consider my women, the food women, he either referred to them as jello abusers, think of all of those molds, right, or they were nicety nice. Well, that I knew wasn't quite right <laughs> because there's some women that were quite nice, and we'll talk about uh, Ruth Gray today who definitely fit in that category. But there were some awfully feisty women that didn't take anything at all, uh, who definitely would have pushed back if advertisers or editorial or anyone would have told them what to do. Uh, in addition, most of them were graduates of what was then called home ec journalism or home economics journalism, which means they took all the classes that would have taught them not to do that. Um, so they came from a background of journalism. So my, I set out to find out what was really in those sections, right? Um, so here's a file full, full of all the actual women, the food sections that were in the paper, right? Um, several of uh, the women had since retired and they had given their entire, all their archives, um, all to libraries, so at least I could look through to see what topics, what was being written about. Um, Jay Nickerson, who we'll talk about, was the food editor at the New York Times for a long time, and all that stuff's indexed. Jello comes up once in the 1950s, for the record. 
I mean, it might have been gelatin, but I'm just saying jello came up at that point once. Um, and so I was able to look at lots and lots of newspapers. I ended up with 62 women by the time I wrote my book. I'm now up to 85. And each one of them were significant, and they wrote great stuff, and they were ethical, and they didn't fit the framework at all of everything else that had been written. Um, in journalism school, we say to our students, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. You need to check it. And I found that no one checked it out about women in the food section. No one actually had examples of what was so bad about it. So I began looking. Um, and so I looked at probably about 50 to 100, mattering at how big the newspaper was, what I had access to. Um, I also looked at all sorts of stuff I was able to get off eBay. Every newspaper had a little, uh, sometimes pamphlets or small things or inserts uh, you could mail in for. Uh, pay a quarter. So they're all on eBay. So I was able to actually look at the things that they were producing. Um, sometimes like special cookie sections at the holidays, that sort of thing. So thanks to eBay, I was able to find all sorts of things um, these women actually produced that kind of countered everything else that had been said. Um, also, they almost all wrote cookbooks. And the most fascinating thing about cookbooks is the dedication page. That's where you learned who taught them to cook who their spouse or their kids' names were, if there were any. Um, all of those kinds of things. Um, this is just a small number of the books that, G or, that Jean Volz wrote when she was first at the LA Times, and then, um, or at the at Miami Herald, and then uh, the LA Times. And so each one of these cookbooks, her dedication pages become more and more interesting as you can realize she's running out of the people that you always dedicate the pages kind of to. Um, and so again, I was able to track down at least one cookbook for every editor. Uh, Jean happens to be a favorite of mine. Um, and there's a few archives where some things exist. There's a Canadian archive that has a whole bunch of Miami Herald food pages, the whole food sections, which is cool, so I could actually look at what was there. I have no idea why, um, but they're there. Um, uh, the Pillsbury Bake Off has in San Antonio a section that I was able to look at the food editors who'd often judge those. Um, and probably most importantly, um, I mentioned Marge Paxson to you. When Marge retired from Gannett, she had no children, no husband, so she had this lump sum of money, and Gannett said that they would match all that money. So she created the National Women in Media Collection at the University of Missouri. So she convinced her friends, Dorothy Journey, uh, Marie Anderson, a whole group to dedicate to all their papers, um, as well as her own, as that was really the treasure trove for me, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But I love this. This is the Rolodex card for James Beard. Look at all the crosshouts right as he was moving, what you used to do on your Rolodex. Um, so, so this is James Beard's Rolodex for James Beard um, for Cicely Brownstone. Cicely Brownstone uh, was a longtime food editor for the Associated Press, where she wrote several uh, stories uh, over the course of the week, plus recipes on top of that. Uh, she gave all her papers to NYU. And so we've got all sorts of things. Um, she also did an oral history. And she was a, a feisty older lady who had a whole lot to say. And so it's been fun just to read through some of that, but as well as all the letters and correspondence that went back and forth. Um, and I always like to mention this in these talks about James Beard. Um, James Beard was discovered, of course, in food sections. In order to sell your cookbooks, you had to have the food writers write about you. And he was first written about in America by uh, Jane Dickerson at the New York Times, who we'll talk about. Um, but he became very good friends with her and Cicely. In fact, they, the three of them, plus Jane's husband, used to often go to dinner and review restaurants. Um, James, it's been said about James, he was not a heterosexual, but he was a ladies' man, in that he was always surrounded by women. And I think about James, and I verified this with some people, I think he'd be mortified or at least sad that his name has so shadowed all the women that made his career possible. You know, you, we all know who James Beard is. Very few of us know who all these other women are. Cicely Brownstone was at his bedside when he died. Um, I mean, sh these women were central to his life. Um, and again, we hear all these things about James Beard, but very rarely about the rest of them that came next. Um, but this is kind of where all my raw data came from, to be able to talk about these women. However, I ran into some problems with names. For a long time, not so much in Florida, but the rest of the nation, the food editor used a pen name, which meant, of course, it was very hard to figure out who some, some of them actually were until they died. It was often in their obits. So-and-so was this at a certain point in time. Um, and this was done um, for very patronizing reasons. The theory was that the woman would get married and leave, get married and have children, she'd never come back again. So if they had one name, it was continuity. In fact, up at Minneapolis, um, the food editor there, her name was Mary Hart. They trademarked her name under the assumption she'd be leaving. She stayed there for four decades. And that was true with so many of the women I looked at. And it, in fact, it was kind of astounding when I got to a certain point. Most journalists go in various positions throughout their career, different newspapers or different beats. But my food editors, 30, 40, even 50 years, they never left. 
I mean, they were integral to their community in that way. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do is make sure I looked at the whole country as I looked at my book. So I went to this book called Coast to Coast Cookery, and it's what it sounds like. Every state's represented, and it was written by the food editors, um, the Food Editors Association. Um, and so I teased out all the names that were in there. If, you know, these were the women I would count on, and, and so they're the ones that came up time and again, and I was able to track down most of them, and they were interesting, significant, had great stories. One of the nice things about when you work at a newspaper is when you retire and when you die, you get long stories written about your career. <laughs> so the great part was I was at least able to get those um, to figure out who some of these women were. Um, but one name that I spent a good part of uh, eight years trying to figure out was who was Ruth Gorell. Ruth Gorell, I knew that she'd gone to K-State. Kansas State had a, a, a big journalism, um, home, ec, uh, home ec journalism program. Uh, a lot of la land grant schools did. Um, so I knew that she'd gone to school there. Um, she was writing here about Smelt, the Detroit Times. I knew she'd been there for at least a decade, and she's done all sorts of things. But then she disappears. There's no other mention of her. But then there's a Ruth Gray, who seems to have some things in common down in St. Pete but yet I can't find any record of their getting married. It's almost always you found someone's wedding. Um, I can't find, so I have no name that goes with that. I have no connection at all. Um, she never mentions when she writes about her family. I don't have a husband's name. So I, I'm never really sure if they're one and the same. When she dies, there's no maiden name included because often that was also the jackpot for me. When someone died, a woman who'd taken her husband's name, but at least get that, nothing. I tried finding her daughter, nothing. Um, so it wasn't until Carol DeMasters, who was a longtime executive editor, um, or executive director, I should say, at the Association of Food Journalists, was able to verify for me. Ruth Gorell was Ruth Gray. But that was kind of the fun mystery of doing this kind of work, too, was trying to match people up. So it took a long time, but I was able to figure out that Ruth Gorell was Ruth Gray, despite the fact there was no other online record of her. Um, in the middle of my research, this is when Google News was um, scanning. So I had the St. Pete Times forever. Um, and so again, there's no record of that. So my guess is she must have gotten married and came with the husband down here, because usually at least write about yourself, where I didn't have the same kind of luck in finding Detroit Times as I would have the St. Pete Times. So my food editors officially started with Jean Volz. Um, as I went to test out, was there any value to the women's section, uh, food sections in the women's section, I started with Jean, because again, she'd been at, at the Miami Herald, which is what I knew best. Um, so I went to look at her career. She um, was raised, by, raised on a farm, a lot of my women were, so you kind of knew about the production of food. Um, her father said that there was only one day a year that peaches were worth eating, and he could tell from the peaches on their tree. So she kind of had some food background. Uh, her grandmother taught her how to cook, and they had big, um, church cookouts and buffets and that sort of thing. That was kind of her background. She um, had a, a degree in journalism and graduated right before the beginning of World War II. So she's another one of these journalists that got to cover the hard news during the war. She wrote about how hard it was to write about friends who were coming back in bags and that sort of thing during World War II. Um, and then she gets married. Um, her, hus her husband was, um, her, I should say, her husband was um, handicapped, was an, uh, so he wasn't uh, drafted. So they get married, who's a sports journalist, um, and they go to Miami. They'd had two young children, and she decided she was gonna be a stay-at-home mom when she first got to Miami. After a slight back injury, the doctor says to her, a stay-at-home mom is too strenuous for you. You just go back to the newspaper, and if you've had young children, you do, there's some truth to that sort of thing. Um, so she had been um, working the copy desk for the women's section, and she got called into uh, her editor's office and said, I know you want better hours for your children. We'd like you to be a food editor. And she said, I don't cook. And he said, teach yourself. And I mention that because if you read the official history of the Miami Herald, read the book that was written about him, it says that she became the editor because she was a gourmet cook. Well, she was one of these women that wasn't nicey nice. I mean that in the most respectful way. Um, she didn't take much of anything, stand, uh, she wouldn't put up with much of anything, I should say. Um, so that's a real story of how she became the editor. Even newspaper histories aren't always truthful about you know, their own histories, if you will. Um, and so she did, she taught herself, and she traveled Florida throughout the 1950s and um, talked about all the regional, regionalities of food. Um, she, again, you saw that picture earlier, wrote numerous cookbooks. Uh, when it gets to um, 1960, she and her husband go to the Miami Herald uh, management and said they would like a raise. They turn them down, so she contacts the LA Times, and what's important about that to her was they had a test kitchen. The Miami Herald never had a test kitchen. LA Times almost always did. Um, so for a test kitchen and a raise, they move um, to the LA Times. 
The LA Times did have uh, their food writer running under a pen name, Marion Manners at that time, and Jean uh, negotiates that she will only come there if that name is not used and advertising has nothing to do with it. So she makes sure in 1960 that that's beginning to change. Um, throughout the 1960s, she became an expert on barbecue, which doesn't seem like a big thing now because we all eat barbecue. But to say that barbecue was a food worth talking about in the 1960s was kind of a radical act, actually. Um, so she wrote, uh, James Beard said her cookbook, um, Barbecue and Butts, was considered the best cookbook at the time on barbecue. Um, and she said at one point in time, she then goes on to uh, Women's Day as a food editor. Um, in, so she's in New York um, in kind of the great uh, years of James Beard uh, and the rest. But she said at one point in time, she got ready to um, judge the barbecue uh, competitions. Four to five times a day she ate barbecue. I mean, that's, that's what she was. Um, so anyway, I researched all her stuff throughout from that decade that she was at the LA Times, and I found all sorts of nuanced things. Sure, the recipes, but there were nutrition stories, stories about how we were going to eat food differently based on the packaging that had come out of World War II as we learned how to transport food differently, um, food contamination stories, the question about eating too much red meat, um, talking about making bread, you know, what I found in looking at this is we fall in love out of making bread every couple of years. Um, but all of these important stories were there. David Camp was clearly wrong in Jean's case. And so if it was just Jean, how many more were out there? And that's what I kind of set looking at. By the time I had 25, I knew I had a book. Um, so again, I ended up with 62, and so I'll share a few more um, Florida food editors before I talk about kind of the change in food sections. Virginia Hepperton followed um, at the Miami Herald after Jean left. Um, this is uh, food with a Florida flair. She wrote several of these pamphlets that I was able to find online to kind of see exactly what she was cooking. However, my favorite story about oh, and Virginia got her uh, home, journalism home ec degree from um, uh, University of no Iowa State, um, as many of them did. Um, Ruth Ellen Church at the Chicago Tribune also came out through that program. My favorite story about Virginia actually happened when she goes to Long Beach. She becomes a food editor in California, and apparently Liberace wrote a cookbook. And Liberace invited all the food editors to his house so he could cook for them. Well, Virginia apparently didn't like some aspect of how he's trying to control the taking of pictures in the kitchen, which again, we always took pictures of our food. Um, and so he kicks her out of his house. And on the way out, she yells, stick to your music, you're a horrible cook. Well, it gets picked up by the wires, and so it's shared everywhere. Um, so again, they weren't all that nicety nice. Um, Diana Rawls, anyone know that name? No. Um, she was uh, the first food editor at the St. Pete Times. She had started at the Society Editor. Um, she created um, the debutante ball. I don't, I don't know if they still have that, but she's the one that created that. <laughs> she's, she's the one that created that. Um, she almost always had the white gloves and the hat. She was known as Miss Royal to her face, the Duchess behind her back. Um, and I find it fascinating. Um, with the cooking, but also with garden clubs. Garden clubs, how often they'd wear the white gloves even when cooking or gardening. It's just fascinating, um, particularly in the heat. One of my favorite stories was in the Milwaukee Journal where the etiquette um, columnists advised if you were going to eat barbecue, it was okay to take off your white gloves. So <laughs> approval had been made. Um, so Diana was the um, initially the society editor, and every newspaper had a society editor. And, the communities were often upper middle class, but there were a few other sometimes um, looking society as a small s instead of the, um, the big s. Um, but she eventually becomes the food editor because she's a gourmet cook. Now, the women I um, studied, some were great cooks. Um, quite often the restaurant critics were. And it was because they had to describe what was right or wrong with a dish, right? Which you kind of want to be able to cook to say that's what too much of this or that is. Um, but some really bristled at this idea that you had to be a good cook to be a food editor, because in their minds, you're simply a journalist doing your job, and it's about food. Most of the time, they made the analogy to sports. A sports reporter didn't have to be great at being a baseball player or a football player. But my favorite um, comparison was Clarice Rollins at the Milwaukee Journal, who said, do you expect your court reporter to go out and commit crimes to be able to write correctly about that? Um, but the idea here was you didn't necessarily have to be a good cook, um, and apparently, that was the story with Ruth Gray. People know Ruth Gray? I gave this talk in Gulfport, and um, at the end, there was a retired St. Pete Times reporter who had known Ruth and said she was such a horrible cook that no one ever ate what she brought when they had potlucks. <laughs> it was that bad. Um, uh, but Ruth Gray uh, was another favorite that I had studied. I looked particularly uh, at what she has done at a, as a restaurant critic. Um, 
throughout the 50s and 60s, um, for the most part, the food critic job went to a man. Often the theory was that, well, he had an opinion to share. The women could cover, but for example, at the LA Times, they could cover ethnic restaurants, but not the kind of high class expensive, that sort of thing. Um, but a few did, as we'll talk about. And Ruth Gray was the first restaurant reviewer, St. Pete Times, that was the early 70s. So I looked at her reviews to kind of see what she was writing about. Um, and she was, could be quite critical. Um, the initial restaurant critics aren't what we think of today. The goal is almost to um, mock how bad a dish could be. It used to be considered a service. So let's say you went to a dinner. You, you and your, the people you brought with you tried four meals. Well, if two, of the, two were very good and two were horrible, you just wrote about the two that was good. The theory was you were doing a service. You, who cares if it's bad? You write about whatever they recommended. It was kind of the way that it was often done. Um, Ruth got at least one chef fired after a bad review. Um, she wrote another bad review and got the, um, that restaurant's crab sandwich named after her. Um, she was of the era where you wore the scarf and you, you know, tried to disguise yourself at least somewhat. Uh, she described taking the notebook into the bathroom stall and you know, taking down the notes of what things were. Um, that if they called her by name at the restaurant, then she would leave and not review it. If they, you know. um, they had to issue an editorial, Ann Rowe, who I talked about earlier, had to issue an editorial saying that people were going into restaurants and claiming to be Ruth Gray to get a free meal. And explain that that's not how it worked at newspapers. And if anyone comes in and says they're Ruth Gray for a free meal, it's clearly not Ruth Gray. Um, but Ruth is one of these ones that I do think of as the nicety nice if Dave Camp wants that. And I think that was important because you wanted your readers to like you. You wanted that connection, right? It wasn't like the New York food community, which you could kind of you know, be at each other's throats, if you will. Um, but she described, after writing one particularly biting restaurant review, she left town for a week. The guilt of being in the community at that time. So I think she was some of that. Um, but again, she wrote some restaurant reviews that were quite critical. Um, she wrote about um, accessibility issues way before we had uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, she wrote about poor service, about being turned away once when she didn't have a coat on on a hot day and it had been raining. Um, so you know, it wasn't just this to promote restaurants. It was much more uh, nuanced than that. Anne McDuffie. Um, she's a longtime food editor at the Tampa Tribune, um, nearly four decades. Uh, she um, was of the true Florida foods. Um, she used to write about how much it upset her when restaurants ser started serving green li uh, key lime pie that was green to make the tourists happy when it wasn't. Not, in fact, she was quoted um, uh, in the Wall Street Journal, I believe, with her disgust over this. Um, she, again, four decades of readership. Um, People talked about um, how food editors sometimes uh, swayed by consumers. She proved the exact opposite when she started columns that would compare the different um, grocery stores in the city, mar the marketplace column, so you could figure out how much milk was at every grocery store, how much bread was, um, you know, how much hamburger was. And of course, that's something that wouldn't have made the local grocers happy. You know, there's more and more um, of women like Anne McDuffie. Part of her claim to fame is writing a great review about the Gasparilla cookbook, which of course is um, the charity cookbook of the Junior League, which raises, uh, just celebrated its 50th uh, anniversary a few years ago. Um, and raises all sorts of money for charity. Um, and at most of these talks, at least one or two women in the audience still have a Gasparilla cookbook from the old days. Um, Grace Barr. So I learned about Grace Barr um, because she was one of the judges um, at the Pillsbury Bake Offs. Um, and so that's what the food editors kind of each year, it was again a, a networking opportunity for them to be able to do that. Um, so I found her name and realized that she was the, had been the food editor at the Orlando Sentinel. And I really lucked out because her son wrote his own unpublished memoirs, which include lots of information about his mom, and gave it to the Orlando History Center. So it will actually see what he thought about mom, which of course is a great gift. Few of my women had children, um, and I haven't been able to track down very few of those that did. So that's his picture of his mom. Um, so Grace Barr, her uh, father was a judge, is considered one of the kind of founders of modern or Orlando, other than Disney, um, the founder of Orlando. And so she kind of had this social class, if you will, that gave her a certain position. She gets married, has twins, um, but she ends up supporting her family during the Great Depression with a bakery in Winter Park. Um, she was known for her recipes that began, take a stick of butter. So as you can imagine, she um, was very unhappy during World War II when the cream and the butter, things she likes to, um, um, she didn't have access to for rations. So after the war, Grace figures out she's already raised her children by herself and divorces her husband. Um, it was interesting, uh, in the memoirs that her son wrote, he always wanted her to remarry, and she said, your father was more than enough for a lifetime. 
Um, so she pretty much never dated again. However, she again was in a certain social class, so she would often be um, the partner that would go with the Sentinel publisher to a different events, um, and the publisher ends up marrying her daughter. Uh, 40 year difference was a scandal of the time. Um, but uh, in order to make money, she goes and becomes the um, society and food editor at the Orlando Sentinel. Um, and she ends up eventually writing um, Cooking with Grace, a cookbook, uh, in 1970. And it was reviewed at the time as one of the best Southern cookbooks, which is kind of interesting, right? Because you don't think of Orlando kind of in that way. But it was reviewed as being one of the best um, Southern cookbooks of its time. So Grace retires. And Dorothy Chapman takes over. Uh, Dorothy was the first restaurant reviewer um, in the early 70s, of course, as Disney and all those restaurants are kind of are coming in. Um, and she wrote the longest column the Orlando Sentinel has ever had, which is called Thought You'd Never Ask. And really, kind of what she offered, her column, her uh, recipe request column, was about restaurants. In other words, you had this great meal at this restaurant, how can I make it at home? Which, of course, isn't that easy of a thing to do, because if you make something at a restaurant, it's in large quantities big batches. You know. And so part of what she would do is work with the cooks to try to get them down um, to something that a home cook would be able to do. Um, there was a recipe exchange column in every single newspaper I looked at. Many of them, again, ran for a very long time. And I like to think of that as early social media, right? This idea that you were exchanging recipes, um, you, lo you lost grandma's recipe for this, um, or you wanted to replicate something. After Hurricane Katrina went through New Orleans, one of the first things their newspaper did um, was if you found your recipe, send them to the newspaper, right? Because they lost all these kind of family heirlooms, and that's how we connect to our communities and our families in that way. Um, similar to, uh, to Grace, Dorothy Chapman had children. She had three, and she was divorced, um, and she was a sole provider for her children. Again, sometimes we talk about the 50s and 60s. We sometimes talk about women working as if it was an option rather than a requirement um, to take care of their families. Um, and so she, um, she had these children that she took, a, take care, took care of by herself. And so she asked if she could become a copy editor, because copy editors made more money than the food editor did. It was a night job, and the Orlando Sentinel said, we will not have any women working at night. But she also wrote about that. And she wrote about the fact that she couldn't give her children what she wanted at Christmas. And so she wrote about the difficulties of being a single uh, mother raising her children. Um, by the 1970s, she's on the Florida's Commission on the Status of Women. So she's definitely reached that position that she's able to kind of speak out about some of those kinds of issues. Rosa Tussa. Rosa Tussa is another favorite. She um, had been the longtime food editor um, at the Milwaukee Sentinel. Her father taught her how to cook, um, which is a little different than some of the other ones that I had found. Um, she was um, eccentric, to, to put it mildly. She ends up marrying a man that she had interviewed for one of her stories at the Milwaukee Sentinel. He was a very large Bulgarian man. His um, obit said he had the beard of a pirate. Um, he said he could trace his lineage back to Attila the Hun, and he'd tell you that a lot. Um, they lived in a castle in Milwaukee, and eventually they moved down, and she becomes a food editor on um, the Palm Beach Post, where she had an, another big property, um, two giant kitchens um, on either side of the house. Um, they raised Great Danes, sometimes six at a time. On at least two occasions I've been able to track down, she got in an argument with an editor and brought three Great Danes with her to the office to make her. That's her. Um, and so, yeah, so she was just this truly um, larger than life sort of woman. Um, she ends up dying on the phone in a conversation with someone from Europe. Um, so she even like died in a very big way. Um, both of her newspapers ran numerous articles um, after her death about just how significant she was. She was definitely a good cook. Um, she traveled a lot internationally. Uh, she was a very good friend of uh, Poppy Cannon, and they would travel a lot together. Because a lot of these women, again, if you want to say that Italian food is authentic, you have to go to Italy to find out, right? So there's a lot of that, that kind of travel. I'm from Milwaukee, so I, Rose is also a favorite of mine for that reason. Um, and I always like to kind of, um, kind of move on by finishing up with Jane Nickerson in my women. Has anyone heard of Jane Nickerson? A few people? Um, if I go to a food place and I ask that question, few do. But if I ask if you know who Craig Claiborne is, almost every hand goes up. <laughs> the reason that you don't know about Jane Nickerson, or at least not much, is because of Craig Claiborne. Jean Nickerson uh, went to Radcliffe, got a degree in English and writing, um, ends up at the New York Times after some women's magazine work in 1942. She was the first food editor at the New York Times. The New York Times is the most studied newspaper in this country. The fact that you don't know about Jane in of itself is a problem. 
So she becomes the food editor in 1942 to 1957. Key food years, right? Because we had rationing, we had sending food to Europe, um, you had the new technologies and canning and freezing and all these things that are happening. Her column was called News of Food. I mean, it's right there. <laughs> Um, in addition to features that she was writing about um, James, she wrote the first story about Craig Claiborne in the country. Um, she was the person at the New York Times. Um, she also reviewed restaurants, again, with Cicely um, and James Beard often. She decides in 1957, after having two children and wanting more, that she's going to leave. She ended up marrying someone that she'd met on the job. He had been a uh, yogurt expert of some kind, and they were going to build a plant in Lakeland. So in 1957, she retires. I think that's important. Or, I'm sorry, <laughs> she resigns, not retired. And I think that's important because some people said she retired, but she resigned. She left in 57, moved to Lakeland, had two more children, divorces her husband, and by 1973, this cookbook's been published by the University Press of Florida, and she's now the food editor at the Lakeland Ledger. And what I love about this book is look at the cover. This isn't the Florida cookbook by Jane Nickerson. This is Jane Nickerson's Florida cookbook. Right? I mean, her expertise is above that. I mean, that's somebody whose name we should know. And even when she ends up dying, uh, the New York Times is a very small piece and refers to her as Jane Steinberg, which was her married name that she never used as a byline and she'd been long since divorced from. Um, but it was really the fact that Craig Claiborne was such a big, larger than life person. And his degree was actually in public relations and advertising, not journalism. So he had a skill set to be able to kind of do some of that. And I think, you know, when I really got to look at Jane Nickerson, I knew that something was wrong with our food journalism history. If it could forget Jane Nickerson, how many other women were out there that we hadn't heard about? Um, and luckily, I've actually, I now know Jane's daughter quite well. And so I've been able to kind of tease out more of the things that she's done. And one of my favorite things is that as I was writing this book, I was a little nervous because I was telling the New York Times about their own history. And there are people that like to tell their own history. Um, and so I tweeted out to um, Pete Wells, who's a food, why don't we have Jane Nickerson in, history, in New York Times history? And he tweeted back, that's wrong. She should be remembered. So I knew that I was going to be okay in the eyes of the New York Times. So every good story needs a villain, right? This is our villain, Senator Moss. So these food editors would get together every year for about um, three to five days at these meetings where they would find out about the new technologies, new products, and new things that were coming out. So this group of food editors, and it would range from about 125 to 150, um, were all female other than two or three. Right? So they met annually. And this was important because this was a time when they couldn't belong to things like the Society of Professional Journalists. So for them to network, I mean, that was an important part of what they were doing. Um, and this wasn't because the advertisers were so smart. These week-long meetings were put together by a food editor, a woman by the name of Grace Hartley um, in Atlanta, who said, I'm sick and tired of going to all these different plants to figure all this stuff out. Can't you guys do something all in one place? So it's not about the food editors being um, manipulated by the food companies, quite the opposite. These women knew what they were doing and they were in charge. And they would have to eat from the beginning of the day to well in the evening, you know, eight to midnight kind of thing. And it seems really great, doesn't it, this idea of eating all these things? Unless you have to and it's for your job and it's all day long, every hour or so, and you have to file a story about it every single day. That's a little different, right, you know, kind of that concept. But they had been doing this for decades. Then in 1971, and they would often have um, big speakers come, nutritionists, um, people in the government. Was, as any conference you kind of go to, there would be kind of a keynote sort of thing. And again, they were not easy to manipulate. In one case, uh, the head of Heinz came to give a talk, and he recommended putting ketchup on their apple pie which, as you can imagine, the women actually wrote about how ridiculous this was. It wasn't like they just took all this in and wrote about it. They wrote about how ridiculous that would be. Um, you know, they were no one's doormat sort of thing. Um, and they would sometimes write, this sounds like something that came from a public relations flack. They would write that in their stories. They were not manipulated by any means. So then imagine that as a woman who's been doing this for all these decades. And again, it was all about women other than two men. Senator Moss comes in. And I have a copy of his actual talk where he talks about the fact that you know, they don't do anything to help consumers and that sort of thing. But he went off script at one point and called all these women in the room whores of the supermarket and then took no questions, just took off. Now, the power of the pen means you get to write about this, right? So the women wrote all sorts of things about how ridiculous this was and that quite the opposite of what Senator Moss had thought. Um, but what it did is it got the attention of the managing editors at newspapers across the country. 
if this truly was what people thought was going on. So in 1972, the University of Houston, they host a meeting about these accusations, where half of them are food editors and half are managing editors. Luckily, a sorority transcribed every word that was said at that meeting. And that transcription ends up in Marjorie Paxson's papers. So halfway through my book, I find every single thing that was said there. And the women pretty much say that if there's anyone who's accepting freebies on their staff, fired. If an advertiser tried to force them to write about something, they wouldn't write about it at all. I mean, they very much would not have been manipulated. In fact, they say the only, thing, the only people that are bothering us in this whole story is the managing editors. Several editors said, the great thing about this was, it's the first time he's ever spoken to me. You know, they were that kind of marginalized in that way. But this meeting went to show that nothing untoward was going on for this whole time period. But the other good thing that comes out of this is the night that this happens, and again, he takes no questions and takes off. He was, kind of, he was known as a consumer guy. He pretended, he went undercover to try to expose well, uh, Medicare. He was that kind of a guy. You know, he liked press attention. Um, that night, Peggy Dom, who'd been the food editor at the Milwaukee Journal, in her Chicago hotel room, a bunch of these women came together and said, that's it. We're creating a group of our own. And so within a few years, they had what's now known as, known as the Association of Food Journalists, where they had their own meetings, they had no one sponsoring, that would make it look potentially untoward, um, gave their own awards, um, the group that still exists um, to this day. So all of that ends up in the food section, um, where again, I document all these different things that were going on, the, comp the, um, the recipe exchange columns, what they were cooking. Um, and you could tell how widely read those sections were, because if there was a typo, that phone rang off the hook. Um, it was so bad, um, it, it had only been, it was the, night, the morning after, um, they had left out how much butter went into a cake recipe. Everyone in the women's section was instructed, just answer the phone with half a stick of butter. Because that was the only thing anyone wanted to know about. Um, which caused the managing, managing editor to say, I didn't realize women cooked this early in the day. Um, and often these sections would have their own copy editor because you wanted someone that would understand that a quarter cup of salt in anything is wrong, right? Um, because as many editors said, you know, it's, of course journalists want to get everything right. It's one thing to get someone's name wrong, but if you get something wrong in a recipe, right, you make them sick, you ruin their event, um, you've lost their trust because they trusted you for that recipe um, in that way. And of course, remember, this was at a time when you had typewriters and you're answering phones and you're doing all these things. You know, it wasn't the ease what we had with the computer. In addition, these sections were so thick, um, 50 to 60 pages at many places, um, at, the t you know, at the height of the consumer. Um, right before Thanksgiving one year at the LA Times, they made nearly a million dollars just in the food section. It never went back to the food section, which is the worst part of all of it. Um, but you know, these sections were kind of huge. Um, they often had a home ec staff. You would call in and say, um, I'd like a recipe for this kind of cookie or cake, which was the most popular by far, request cookies and cakes. Um, and someone would make a copy and send it to you. I mean, it was that kind of service and connection to your community. Um, because they were often criticized for not having enough vegetable and uh, good for you food. But as they said, we're responding to our readers, and they don't necessarily want that. Um, the one thing that never went out of style was bacon. We've always liked bacon. Um, we had um, we've gone back and forth about being vegetarians, about making our own bread or not. A lot of these things kind of happened in waves over time. Um, they were often very connected to each other. They would quote each other in their stories, um, pick up each other's pieces in syndication. So it was definitely you know, a community um, in that sort of way. So they're the women that are in the food section. Um, my food section, uh, my book doesn't have any pictures because I had kind of a uh, difficult publisher in that area, but it has its own Pinterest page where you can see pictures of every single one um, of these 60 women. Um, as I said at the beginning, Florida was really the place to be, um, and we know that in large part because they won the most Penny Missouri Awards in the 1960s. In 1960, the University of Missouri and J.C. Penny Company partnered together. Penny just gave the money, they were hands off with the content, but the faculty at the University of Missouri judged they, the whole point was to improve the women's section. So if you won, then you went and you went to that next year's workshop and explained to everyone what you did. The thought that you kind of keep improving in that way. Um, Florida newspapers dominated. They had four circulation categories we always placed. Um, Marie Anderson, who I mentioned at the beginning, she won so often, they eventually retired her from the competition. There was just no one anyone could win over her section in that way. Um, but then she always went and she helped out the next group in that sort of way. Um, and so 
Florida really was, particularly uh, South Florida, was really the place to be for that reason. Um, and so again, they led me to the fact that the food editors of those sections had to be pretty darn good too. Um, so those are my ladies. Do you have any questions? Or memories of your food editor? Yeah, Janice. Yes. Did you spend much time like microfilm, microfiche? Well, I really lucked out. Um, oh, sure. Thank you. <laughs> the question was about how I got these actual sections. I go through microfiche, how I found it. Thank you. Um, when I first started, it was when Google News was scanning from the beginning of the end um, to newspapers. So, for example, the Milwaukee Journal, I'm from Milwaukee, so I could look at the very first Milwaukee Journal um, section, and they had, a, they had their first food store within the first week in the 1880s. Um, St. Pete Times was in that group. So I had all of those that was kind of the ease of getting to it. The New York Times was easy because everything's already in databases. Um, Newsbank has the LA Times and several of the others, so I would buy, say, a week long pass and spend forever. Um, same with the Omaha newspaper, I got the 50, um, I had 24 hours to get 50 of Maude Coon's stories. And so it was just about kind of gathering, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, but in the Boston Globe was that way, the Chicago Tribune. So as soon as I found a news service, and part of it, I'm lucky because I'm at a university and I had interlibrary loan that could pull a lot of that, but I still to this day have piles and piles of these sections that I hope to go through kind of even further with that. Um, and again, I found a handful of places where food editors had donated their files. Um, so two newspapers in Ohio. Uh, luckily, they'd already even indexed it. So I could look, for example, and say, how many different co uh, chocolate chip cookies recipes that they run over the years. How often was bread? So those were kind of some of the things that I was able to kind of tease out. In addition, like I said, a lot of them had great retirement stories. Um, or when they died, if, they were, if the newspaper was still there, then I had all that stuff to kind of draw from because very few of the women were still alive. I had email interviews with three women that were still alive. Um, also, when I was in the very beginnings of this, um, um, How, How America Eats came out, which is the, um, the only book written about a food editor, and that was Clementine, uh, Clementine Paddleford. Um, and it was a great driving force because I learned a lot about that. She gave all her papers to K-State, but only recently discovered. The only problem for me was everyone treated her like she was the only one that had done that. Um, Jean Volz flew her own plane. Clarice Rollins flew her, her own plane to these places. In addition, um, she was known, Clementine, for going to different cities and writing about how America eats. But the key was for her to do that well she had to know the food editor in that city, right? Which is the story that was not actually in that book. Um, you know, I've got, I can't remember the woman's name, who was the old um, food editor at the Tampa newspaper before, Clendon? Clendon, Clendon that's it. Um, and so she talked about the fact that she got the call from Clementine. So she had to go find the best Tampa ho household and the, they had the best Cuban food. So in order for Clementine to do what she did, these women, kind of further get pushed aside because while Clementine was great, she also had um, a history of plagiarizing her recipes, which you find in other books, but not in that book about her. Which again, you know, it was very laudatory, but she, um, yeah, uh, if you read some of the letters that these folks would write back and forth, they would mention, make sure you go to Jane Nickerson because Clementine's gonna steal it. I mean, it was that blatant of what you should kind of do um, in, in that way. So. You know, those things kind of came together. Um, it's why I kind of locked up, but it was really important to me to look at the actual sections um, to make sure that camp was wrong. You know, I really wanted to see what that was. Um, and then it was really very much toward the end when I found this oral history that um, um, Cicely Brownstone had done. And so she, she's asked, what, she was at that point where there's no filter left. You know, she was in her early 90s and there was just nothing that wasn't coming out. Um, and so she has all sorts of things, and a little bit of exaggeration about her own career, um, but that oral history was really helpful. And what was really interesting about that is um, she had mentioned that Jane Nickerson was actually the, food, the New York Times food editor that wrote the famous New York Times cookbook. It wasn't all Craig Claiborne. Sure, um, it wasn't, Craig Claiborne was kind of most famous for writing the New York Times cookbook in the early 1960s. But according to Cicely Brownstone, those weren't all Craig's recipes, which begins to make sense if you think about the fact that he was only hired in 1957. The book comes out, I want to say 62 or 63, which led me to some research. Someone had actually sat down and took the time to look at all the recipes that were in that cookbook and under whose tenure they ran, and half of, the, half of those recipes were Jane's and not Craig Claiborne's. 
which, you know, to me is kind of a, and again, if you look, Craig never actually says they're his, but he implies it throughout. Um, and he, you know, his um, acknowledgement is to the home economist that worked, that Jane had hired. Um, so all of those kinds of things, almost, um, you know, serendipity kind of came together to go, this is it. <laughs> This is, this is. And so I finished again with 62, but I'm up to 85, um, often because I give talks like this and someone goes, oh, you haven't heard of so-and-so. And sure enough, I go online and they have their own unique, amazing story. Because um, that's what was really great, is that each one of these, um, one of the women um, ends up getting multiple sclerosis and writes the first cookbook about um, cooking from a wheelchair. Her previous job had been in Chicago to test meat. Her job, she and fellow economists would come down and they would have to eat a bunch of steak once a day and tell them which one was the best, which sounds like an amazing job. <laughs> um, but you know, they all had those kinds of stories to tell um, that said, gosh, I mean, how could we not know them? And I think part of it is that you know, we've allowed people to make generalizations about 1950s and 1960s food um, that was all about Jell-O. And if it was about Jell-O, it was probably in women's magazines that were in color. Because the key to Jell-O in foods is color, which you wouldn't have had as often right, in a newspaper. Um, but we also were eating international food throughout the 1950s because of the jet set, because Pan Am had, you know, and um, what's the other one, Pan Am and um, TWI would have these cookbooks. Um, so this idea that Julia Chow was the first one teaching about French cooking is kind of a generalization. You saw a lot of this, and so, you know, what I really wanted to do was what was the real story? What was in the sections? What were women asking for? Uh, Ruth Ellen Church was the Chicago Tribune for a long time. Um, and she um, wrote a lot of columns about what was most commonly asked for. And so that helped me to kind of trace back some of that. Um, she was a, the country's first wine editor, um, which showed that we were kind of been actually drinking wine earlier than kind of stories had told. Um, with Ellen Church, the Chicago Tribune hired a, a writer by the name of Morrison Wood and then syndicated his column. And it was called um, Cooking for Men which kind of proved that men were cooking well before this idea that men were just grilling. So, I mean, you saw, you, you saw a lot of nuance that I hadn't expected to be there. And again, I think it's this generalization about 50s and 60s in women that get either not tested or repeated as if um, they're the truth. So my, my job now is I'm now going to look at um, the fashion editors um, of that time period, which of course meant these women got to travel and do all sorts of things. Um, we talk about fashion sometimes the same way as food, but those are two things that form our everyday lives, um, and of course, are also big business. Well, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Oh, do you have a question? Sure. I, it's like putting my ignorance on display. <laughs> but since I now have no filter, who was my reward? Who was Senator Boss is from Utah, um, and this was in that era that we saw the rise of um, the consumer questioning things, um, Ralph Nader, that sort of thing. And so he was part of that group. And so he's always kind of, his, theory was that women were on the take and this was unfair to the consumer. Um, and she also blamed those who were writing about travel and writing about the automobile. Um, and so that was kind of, but he never spoke about it again other than one other time where he said that maybe the government should start regulating the food section, which you know, is an impossibility under the First Amendment. Um, but that was kind of his, his big moment. It also happened that about that time, um, a journalism publication had written some pretty negative things and so it was kind of those two that came together. But even when I tested out what that writer had written, he had made up quotes. He had not interviewed the people that, you know, the top, here's who you talk to. So, uh, and he was a freelancer at that, so it wasn't like a staff reporter that was doing some of this. Um, and I never found out anything more about him again, the freelance writer. Um, but he, uh, not for this reason, but Moss does not get reelected the next time. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. you